Hey everybody, now that we're here in the fall season and Halloween is just a few days away, I want to show you how to photograph one of the best targets this time of year, and that is the Ghost Nebula. I actually photographed this target for the first time during my recent deep space workshops in Kanab, and I gotta say this is probably the most challenging target I've ever done. So I learned a lot along the way, and I want to show you guys how to get the best possible results. The first thing to understand about the Ghost Nebula is that, as you can expect, it's hard to find if it is a ghost after all. So what you need to do is first know the SH number. This is like the NGC number or the Messier number, but this is what you're going to use to plug into your go-to software and find the target. And the Ghost Nebula is SH2136. So if you put that in your go-to mount software, whether that's the Sky Atlas or whatever, it should be able to find it. Now that you know how to find the Ghost Nebula, let's talk about the focal length that'll work best. You are going to want a lot of zoom here. So for reference, I used the ASCAR V in the 80mm plus extender configuration. That gave me 600mm. Then I attached my ASI 533 monochrome camera, which has a 2.7x crop. So if we multiply our 600mm focal length by 2.7, that gives us effectively 1600mm for this shot here. And I will say that to really resolve the fine details, you will need at least 1500 millimeters of effective focal length, whether that's your telescope's real focal length or if you're factoring in your sensor size multiplying the field of view. Okay, so we've got our target name, we've got our focal length figured out. Now, if you're using the ASI Air and an AM5, for example, you should be able to hit Go To on SH2136, and it will go through and center up the object automatically. This brings us to another problem, though. The Ghost Nebula is so faint, you might not see anything at all. There might be a faint smudge, but it won't even look like the Ghost Nebula. So the best I can do is just show you one of my raw photos and give you an idea of what it looked like for me. This is with the L filter on. All right, at this point, you have a realistic idea of what it's going to look like through your telescope, now we need to talk about your camera settings. This really just comes down to your specific camera in terms of the gain. For most ZWO cameras, you want your gain at a value of 100. Although if you have like the 294, you'd want a gain of 120. And if you're not sure, just take a look at your camera spec sheet on ZWO's website, and there should be a gain value listed there. That's the one you want to go with. All right, now that we've covered gain, let's talk about your exposure length. I was shooting with L, R, G, and B filters with my monochrome camera, and my exposure length is normally five minutes long. That gives me just enough light to get out off that noise floor, and ultimately have a cleaner, more defined photo. But the problem I was running into is that because I was effectively at 1600 millimeters field of view, well, the problem was I was getting a slight bit of star trailing in all of my photos at five minutes. So what we decide is why don't we drop that down to three minutes instead, that was able to eliminate those slight star trails for a sharper image. And that's what I'd recommend for you as well, is that if you can't shoot upwards of five minutes due to the high field of view, or rather small field of view, then drop it down to three minutes, maybe even two minutes if you absolutely have to. Now we have our consideration of how many photos to take per filter with a monochrome camera. Originally, I was thinking, well, let me just get a lot of RGB data, and then I'll get some luminance data if I have some extra time. But what I realized for this target is that if you want a clean photo, you want to get about even parts L data and RGB data. So for example, if you get two hours of data for red, green, and blue, try to get at least two hours of data for luminance, if not substantially more. Because what you'll find is that the more luminance data you capture, the more the Ghost Nebula is really going to stand out against the background, and overall the cleaner your photo will be. My next bit of advice is just to gather as much data as you possibly can. We were actually investing entire nights into just photographing this one target. I think we started off doing like eight hours of data total for RGB and then luminance. And then we realized it was still very grainy. So we got even more data, it was still grainy. So after about three nights of just focusing on the ghost, we had just enough data. But as you'll see during the processing, it still was pretty grainy. Now keep in mind, I'm shooting at f7.5, which is not letting in a lot of light. So if you had an f5 aperture, or even less than that potentially, you could get away with this target in maybe 16 hours or less. But for me, I'd like to be at least 16, maybe even 30 hours of data for the Ghost Nebula, because it is a very dark, dusty little thing. 
Now that you know how to photograph the Ghost Nebula, let's head over to PixInsight and begin our workflow, and I'll show you how to really make this image stand out a lot better. Welcome back, we're here on the computer now, and we're ready to go through our post-processing workflow. I am going to be skipping over the stacking steps though, because that's going to take at least 20 minutes to go through it as well as I would like, and we don't have time for that today, unfortunately. I will save that for a separate video down the road. What I wanted to show you though, is how much data I gathered for each filter. As we can see here with my blue filter, I had almost four hours of data. The green filter, this is not accurate. I had close to four hours of data as well. I just didn't include them. Luminance, also about four hours. And then red, a little bit over four hours. The reason I'm showing you this is because even though I had a lot of exposure time, the image was still quite grainy. I just want you to be aware of what I was shooting. That way you know realistically what you're in for. I should also mention I was using the ASCAR V telescope which is about 600 millimeters with the extender and an aperture value of f 7.5. So not exactly a lot of light coming in. And these were taken with the ZWO LRGB filters, which I'm gonna be doing a separate video on that as well because they're not the best. And I think I'm gonna upgrade them at some point here in the future. But anyway, that's how much exposure time I had. Again, I tried to get about four hours per filter, but you can imagine four hours per filter that took multiple nights to gather all that data. If you have a color camera, that will make things easier, but you'll still want to get multiple nights worth. So you have at least 16 hours, if not even closer to 30 hours of data, if possible for the best final image. Okay. So assuming you've gone through and stacked your images, the next step is to, of course, load up our photo. For this, we'll go to file open and we'll go to our directory here into our master folder. And there's a lot of files in here, but you're looking for the ones that have auto crop. They're normally the largest files, the most recent files, and the longest file name, that's what you're looking for. In my case, I took red, luminance, green, and blue. So I'm gonna select those auto crop versions and then hit open. When this comes up, it always has a auto crop mask, which we don't need. So I'll close that out for all of my images. And now I'm left with my actual photos. The naming convention is very convoluted though. So I'd recommend we rename our photos immediately. We can do that by clicking this little name tag and if we double click on that, we see here this was my blue filter. So I'll rename it to blue. And that'll just make it much easier moving forward. We have another image here. I'll double click on the file name. It looks like this was green. Then we have, looks like luminance. So I'll just leave it with L. And this must be our red photo right here. Yeah, red. Okay. Now I'd rather just leave these all in their linear state without doing any stretching, just so you get a more of a wow factor. And what we need to do is combine these all into our color photo. The simplest way to do that is with the channel combination. And one of the things I've learned recently is if you use your process explorer on the left, it's way faster if you don't have anything here to just search for it up top. There's a little tiny search window and you can type in channel combination right there. So we'll click on it. It brings us to the tool here in our toolbar, and then we'll double click on it. With our channel combination tool active, we can now drag our blue name tag and drop it on blue. And if that's not working, you can always click this little box right here and just select it manually. So for green, I'll do that. But I like to just drag and drop, that's kind of fun. So now we've got red, green, and blue. Everything looks fine we'll click on the square button and that should create our color photo. No, I didn't. All right, so if that doesn't work, we'll click on the circular button because that makes sense with Pix and Sight, right? Squares, circles, triangles. I'll stop my complaining already. <laughs> there we go. So the next step with our new color image is to hit Control or Command A to stretch the data. Or if you don't like that approach, just go to your Process Explorer and then search for Screen Transfer Function. With the screen transfer function tool, we'll click on the nuclear button. That's the same exact thing as control A, but some people prefer going this route, that's fine. And look at that, isn't that amazing? Wow, completely red. <laughs> I guess that's Halloween-y. So let's minimize all these images, get them out of the way. And we'll try to stay organized here at the start. So I've got my blue, green, actually that's luminance, we'll need that one in a minute. Red is over here. Okay, so the easiest way to fix your color cast 
is just to turn off the chain link. This unlinks the RGB channels now, and it allows it to move one way or the other to remove a color cast for you. If you had your chain link turned on, then you're gonna get a weird color cast like this. But we turn it off and nuke the photo. There we go. That's a pretty good color correction. But if you want even better results, let's do another technique, which is called spectrophotometric color calibration. Before we do that though, we should turn on the chain link, nuke the photo so we're back at square one. So if you wanna do a color correction, we'll grab spectrophotometric color calibration. And if you don't have it, just use the search for window up top here and just type in spectro and you'll find it that way. Okay, so one of the reasons I showed you this chain link is because we need to neutralize the background color cast. And if it's completely red, then we can't see anything at all. So again, if we turn off the RGB channels, or rather the link for the RGB channels, we nuke the photo. What part of the photo has a color cast that I wanna fix? Well, I can fix a green color cast very easily with a tool towards the end of the workflow. The purple is gonna be much more difficult to fix, so that's actually what I'm gonna focus on. So what we need to do is find an area that does not have any nebulosity, maybe up over here, where it's just kind of purplish. And you can see too, I have a ton of color noise, even though I had 12 hours of color data, it's still a lot of color noise. This is where the luminance really comes in handy in a few minutes, but I just wanted to make you aware that even with all the exposure time I have, it's still very grainy. Anyway, I was trying to find a spot to color correct our background. Once I think I've found it, I'll click this button up top here that says new preview mode. Kind of looks like a PDF icon. With our new preview mode, we should have a little cursor and you're gonna drag this out over the region that you wanna remove the color cast, like so. All right, now on the left, we have our image 09 as it's being called and our preview one. We'll click on preview one and we're just seeing that little tiny preview. Then we'll drag preview one's name tag to our region of interest where you see the plus sign. Normally if you go above from preview, you'll get the plus sign. And then we'll drag and drop it right there. Again, we drag our preview one name tag until we see the plus sign down here. That copies over the values. Next, we click back on image 09 so we're seeing the full image and now we can worry about SPCC. For this photo, I was using the ZWO red, green, and blue filters, which I'll choose from the drop down menu. If you had a color camera though, you'd probably just stick with the Sony CMOS, whatever the defaults were for using a ZWO camera. And one thing I forgot to mention is that if you are using narrowband filters, that's a bad idea. You do not want to use narrowband filters for this target because it is kind of a broad spectrum target and this will just cut down on the amount of light coming in. Probably should have mentioned that one earlier, but at least we're getting to it now. So again, for most people, you're probably just gonna choose the defaults and that's gonna work fine. But if you're shooting in monochrome, make sure you're choosing the correct filters. Because we're not shooting in narrowband, average spiral galaxy should be fine. The quantum efficiency curve, if you know what your camera model is, you can choose it. If not, don't worry about it. I was using the 533 though, so I'll choose that option there. And that should be all there is to it. We've got our red, green, and blue filters. We've specified a region of interest. Let's give it a shot. We'll drag and drop our triangle on the photo. And if this fails for some reason or doesn't work as intended, again, make sure that you had the main image selected. You weren't still on the little tiny uh, preview window. Because if you're on the preview, that's gonna screw everything up. All right, we have our graph here that looks halfway decent. We've got some lines and some green dots. It looks fine. We can close out of that graph. Now, in order to get our new preview image, We'll turn on the chain link. It's very important you turn on the chain link and then nuke the photo again. We are now looking at our color corrected image. There's a very heavy green color cast, but again, I'm not worried about that because I can fix that with one click in a few minutes. As long as there's no weird reds or blues, I'm happy. Now you might be thinking, why is there such a weird green color cast? Normally if you're using a color camera, it's even from corner to corner, but I think this is down to the ZWO filters I'm using they're just kind of the cheapest model I found like three years ago and I've still been using them. But uh, as I said, I'm gonna be doing a separate video once I get some new filters and we'll see if that fixes this weird problem that we're noticing today. Anyway, our color cast is now at least somewhat fixed. Good enough for right now. The next step is to run our three tools from Russell Croman: Blur Exterminator, Star Exterminator, and then Noise Exterminator in that order. 
And if you don't have these tools yet, I'd highly recommend purchasing them. That's some of the best money you can spend for this hobby, especially Blur Exterminator. This is gonna transform your images. If you've got Blur Exterminator installed and ready to go, I'd recommend sticking with the default settings if you don't know what you're doing. But if you see that your stars are really kind of blurry, I mean, mine are not good, I might increase the sharpen stars amount. And if I adjust the star halos minus 0.5, that will help to reduce those halos as well. And then for the sharpen on stellar, that's kind of this stuff in here, I really need to do that. So I'll increase that all the way to point, or rather just 1.0. Okay, so I just barely increased the default settings to give me a slightly sharper image. And then I can drag and drop this on the photo, the triangle that is. Blur Exterminator has finished. Let's do a before and after. Here's our before. We had really big bright stars. After, they're much less noticeable. That'll go a long way for our final image. And if we do it from back here, and it really is remarkable just how well Blur Exterminator works. It's basically a star reduction, if you will. Speaking of star reductions, the next step is Star Exterminator. This will completely remove the stars so we can focus in on the nebula. Let's go through now and generate a star image and then run Star Exterminator. When that finishes, you should now have a stars image and then your background photo. And we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves here because we have this full screen preview. So what I'm gonna do is go to the upper right corner and click on the normalize button. That'll make this a bit easier to follow along with. So we have our stars image here, our background nebula photo here. I'm gonna delete this preview one because we don't really need it anymore. So I'll right click on it and delete it. There we go. We can close out of star exterminator and all that would be left is noise exterminator to clean up all this color grain that's still in the photo. But this is where that luminance data comes in handy if you gathered, of course, the luminance data. So if I bring this window back up to the front here, I'll hit Control or Command A to stretch the data and check out that luminance data. That really has a lot of important details here. And we're gonna do the same steps. Because it's monochrome though, we don't have to worry about color correcting it. We'll just start with blur exterminator. And these stars are really big and bright, so I'm even gonna ingest this a bit further. We'll give that a try. Okay, that looks considerably better. There's our before and after. That looks great. Thanks to Russell Croman again for saving the day. We've run Blur Exterminator on our Luminance data. Let's run uh, Star Exterminator next on the Luminance data. And at this point, we have a lot of different stuff going on. It can get kind of confusing. Right now, this one is called L stars, so we can minimize it and just put it somewhere up over here. Then we have our L data, our RGB data, and we should probably rename image 09 because that doesn't make any sense to us, right? We'll double click on it and we'll call this RGB. That makes way more sense. And therefore, this image here, this will be our RGB stars. And we're not gonna need the stars for a while, so I'll minimize those as well and put them up top here. Now we have our RGB data and our luminance data. And let's take a look, because what we see is that the luminance data has all these amazing details, whereas the RGB data, it's not quite as obvious what we're looking at. For example, check out these little ghost people right there. See how much more defined they are in the luminance? That's why I wanted you to capture equal amounts RGB and luminance data, because this goes a long way. Okay, so that explains our luminance data. We are now ready to combine the two into an L RGB image. But before we do that, we need to stretch both photos, because if you see this little green line, they're currently in what's called the linear state, which means technically they're still pitch black. <laughs> this is just a preview we've been looking at. So in order to actually make these look as they should, we need to stretch that data, get it out of the linear state. For this, you'll need the screen transfer function tool and the histogram transformation tool. Again, both of these can be found using the search window up top if you don't have them already. When you've got your histogram transformation and your screen transfer function tool, the next step is to click on the check marks. You always wanna do this. This is the best tip I can give you in terms of your stretching. 
The reason we turn on the check marks for both tools is because now, look what it says, screen transfer function L. That means it's targeting my luminance image. But if I click on my RGB photo, now it says RGB. And the histogram also says RGB down here or L, depending on which image I have selected. This will not happen if the check marks are not turned on. So again, this just makes it so you actually are targeting the photo you intend to. All you have to do is click on the check marks, click on your first photo, and then drag the triangle from your screen transfer function, drag that triangle to the bottom of the histogram window where it's kind of beige and you see the hourglass icon, and then let go. We see that this changed a little bit. So we've copied the settings from this to this, but now we need to apply it to the image. We do that by clicking on the square at the bottom of the histogram window. And if you did that correctly, the image should go pure white. To fix that, very simply click on the reset button on both tools. So we'll reset the histogram, reset the screen transfer function. We have now stretched our luminance data. Let's repeat that step for RGB. So we'll click on RGB. We'll drag our triangle, drop it on the bottom of the histogram window, click on the square, reset our histogram, reset our screen transfer, and there we go. I know I went through that a bit quickly. You can always rewind it five or 10 seconds and watch me do it again. But at this point, the green line has disappeared. The images are no longer in a linear state. What we see is actually what we get. We can now close out of both these tools for the time being. At this point, we can now create our LRGB image and we can also fix this green color cast. Why don't we do that first? To fix a green color cast, go to your process explorer, use the search window, and type in SCNR. SCNR will allow you to remove any color cast, whether it's green, red, or blue. But normally it's a green color cast we're trying to get rid of. Then you just drag and drop your triangle onto the photo, and look at that, problem solved. This will not work though, if your image is in that linear state before stretching. That's why we had to wait until now to fix it. But again, if you have a green color cast, grab SCNR, Drag and drop your triangle onto the stretch photo, and problem solved. Now we can combine our L data with our RGB data. For this, we'll grab the Process Explorer again, and we're going to need LRGB combination. We'll just type that up top, LRGB. There we go. With the LRGB combination, what we're trying to do is incorporate the L data to our RGB. So we're actually gonna turn off R, G, and B. For L, we'll drag the name tag over, drop it in there so we know what we're doing. We're gonna turn on chrominance noise reduction because that's all this ugly color noise right here we wanna get rid of. Then we'll drag our triangle and drop it on our RGB image. But before we do that, we should probably duplicate this. So for this, you'll go to the very top left, there's a little duplicate image button, that's the way I like to do it anyway. And we're gonna call this new image LRGB. So there's a new LRGB image, we can minimize the original RGB photo, put it up over here maybe. And now let's get back on track. So we've got our L data mapped to the L color channel. We've turned off R, G, and B. We've checked the box for chromatic, uh, rather chrominance noise reduction. Then we drag and drop this on our new LRGB photo. And check that out. Here's our before and after. It's a noticeable difference once we get that L data added in. And if we look here at our little ghostly arm, once we add in the luminance data, there's a lot more definition and the color noise is significantly reduced. And again, if you're using color camera, you can't really get L, so don't worry about it. But this is mainly for those monochrome guys. All right, I'm gonna minimize the L data as well. I don't know where it just went, somewhere. Well, I guess we'll find it later at some point. Anyway, this is now our LRGB image. It's stretched and it's ready for further processing. Now would be a great time to run Noise Exterminator if you still have it. If not, you can always find that on your left-hand process explorer. With Noise Exterminator, well, let's think about this. We have quite a bit of grain still. Again, this was multiple nights worth of data, but it's still very grainy. So what I wanna do is have a fairly high denoise amount, 
but I want to increase the detail so we don't lose these little waving ghost people right here. So I'll put it to 0.25 for the detail and 0.7 to start off with. We'll see what happens. I'll drag and drop it on the photo. And now if we do our before and after, you can see that Noise Exterminator has reduced the grain, but kept most of the fine details. In your case though, it might have gone too far or not far enough. So you can always undo it and then increase the detail slider and then run it again. When this updated Noise Exterminator has completed, I'd recommend again toggling before and after, checking over the photo and making sure it looks good. And I gotta say, this is already looking really good. We could even call it right here, but as you know, there's always more to do. So the next step is to save this as a color image. We'll go to File, Save As, and I'm gonna create a new folder here called TIFF. That's where I normally save everything. Inside of the TIFF folder, I'll name this YouTube for today. And you have to remember to save this as a TIFF file because by default, PigsInsight tends to do XISF and Photoshop does not understand what that format is. And then when this comes up, we don't really care about that. It's important though that you change it to 16 bits just because if you leave it at 32, Photoshop can't really utilize that data very well. 16 bits, you can do everything you want to. All right. We now have a TIFF file that we can work with. Before we move to Photoshop though, let's save our PixInsight project because if the computer crashes or we accidentally close this out, we will lose access to everything we've done. So we'll save our project and then we'll click on the folder icon right here. I normally save this in the PixStack directory because that makes sense to me anyway. And we'll call it ghost, whatever you want to do. Now that you've named your file and you've saved it in a folder where you can find it, we'll click OK. Again, the whole point of doing that was we can always come back to this step in our workflow if we ever need to in the future. We can now move on to Photoshop. And I'm going to file open and I've grabbed my photo. I'm going to close out of this little thing there. And it looks OK from here, but there's a bit of a red color cast and a bit of a blue down here. So the first thing I like to do is try to reduce any kind of color casts. We'll start by duplicating our background layer and we'll call this gradient exterminator. Next, we'll grab the lasso tool from the left hand toolbar. And with the lasso tool, we need to select the brightest part of our photo. So I'm just going to kind of trace out the ghost nebula like so. That's fine. Then we'll go up to select Select and Mask. With the Select and Mask tool, you might need to change the view mode up top here to Overlay. That'll give you a better idea of what you're doing. And then we want to look for the feather amount right here. Just feather this out so there's not a harsh edge like there was originally. And you can also shift the edge one way or the other to give you a little bit more wiggle room like that. That looks good enough for right now. We'll hit OK. And before we apply Gradient Exterminator, we need to invert our selection. Because if we run it now, it's only going to affect the nebula, which is the opposite of what we want. Very simply, just go to Select, Inverse. That will do what I'm trying to do. Now that we've clicked on Select, Inverse, we're targeting everything except for the nebula. Finally, we'll go to Filter, RC Astro, Gradient Exterminator. And of course, if you don't have this, you'll need to buy it, but it really is a good piece of software, so I'd recommend it. This is also from Russell Croman, as you would expect by the name. And with Gradient Exterminator, there's an option to balance your background color, which is a pretty good idea in this case. I recommend sticking with medium and medium, and then we'll hit OK. Wow. Yeah, that worked. Uh, let's deselect with Controller Command D. Yeah, that'll do it. I mean, before we had all kinds of color gradients going on, which you could argue didn't look that bad, but it was a bit distracting and now we don't have anything whatsoever. If that did not work very well, you can always undo gradient exterminator and run it again with different settings. Maybe this time you use a low aggressiveness or whatever you want to do, and then you can run it again. But if we turn off balanced background color, then it's not going to do, uh, I guess it did it to some degree. I was going to say it's not going to fix the colors, but in that case, it did a pretty good job. 
that's definitely better than it was. And I think that'll work for us today. So spend a few minutes getting Gradient Exterminator figured out. When you're ready, we're gonna move on. And the next step is to grab a Curves Adjustment Layer. With our Curves Adjustment Layer, now we're focused on contrast because we've got everything looking fairly normal. We'll click on the Hand Tool. And with the Hand Tool selected, we're gonna click and drag down to make an area darker, like this background sky. Then we'll find some dust, we'll click and drag up to make that brighter. And when I do that, you can see the image is starting to fall apart a little bit. A lot of this is just remnants from Star Exterminator. These are weird little blurry spots. So that's not really that big of a deal. Those will get covered up when we add our stars back in later. But the reason I'm showing you this is because even after two or three nights of solid data capture, it's still just starting to fall apart at this point in the workflow, which is why you really need a lot, a lot of data, which is the one thing I've been trying to drive home to you this whole time. Anyway, the less you stretch the data, the less obvious it is how bad the photo kind of looks. So just watch out for that. And it's actually not bad. I'm gonna lower the opacity a bit of this curves layer so it's not as intense. But yeah, I think that'll work. If you want, you can always go back and add a second curves adjustment layer. And then this time you can further tweak that contrast a bit to make it brighter and then darker. That looks pretty good right there. So in just a few layers, we've gone from that, which looks fine, to that, which is a bit stylized, but I think it'll work for us today. Let's save our TIFF real fast. And next, we're gonna hit Command-Shift-Option-E or Control-Shift-Alt-E. That's gonna create a composite layer. Again, that's Control-Shift-Alt-E at the same time or Command-Shift-Option-E. If you did that correctly, you should now have layer one. We're gonna rename this though to, let's call it contrast. With our new contrast layer, that's a composite of everything we've done. We'll go to filter, camera raw filter. The camera raw filter is one of the best ways to do our adjustments. And thankfully I still have the older version of camera raw. I hate the newer version, they've screwed up the interface once again. But if you are using a newer version, it probably says light and you have access to just these sliders here and nothing else. If so, that's fine. Uh, but that's something you wanna watch out for. Regardless, whether using this version or the newer version, start off in your basic tab or light tab and adjust your contrast, your highlights, your shadows, your whites, and your black sliders until the image looks good to you. This is entirely up to your own artistic tastes if you want to have a more dark and spooky ghost or something a little bit more bright and festive, whatever you want to do. Again, all I care about in this initial pass is the exposure settings here to make it brighter, darker, and more contrasty. When that looks good and you're not blowing out the core here, which is easy to do, then we can move on and hit OK. That will apply these changes to the image. So that was just a very simple way to make the photo darker in my case. Then we'll hit Command Shift Option E again, or Control Shift Alt E. That just creates another new layer. We'll rename this one now to, let's say color. And it's important that you rename all these layers because this just helps make it easier for you when you come back tomorrow or a week from now or whenever. With our color layer, we'll go back to Filter, Camera Raw Filter. Make sure you are selecting the one down here because if you click on the top one, that just reapplies the same filter. So we'll click on Camera Raw Filter, and I think we said this one was color, right? So now we only care about the color. For this, we can adjust our temperature and tint if we think that will help the image. Again, this is entirely up to your own personal tastes. And then once you've gotten the colors in terms of your temperature and tint, you can also try the color grading tool, which is a lot of fun. When you get inside your color grading tool, You've got a shadows, midtones, and highlights wheel. I'd recommend clicking on these big buttons so you see them separately. And I normally start with the shadows. The way this works is you click and drag out from the center, and you're gonna move this little dot around while you look at the photo. So I normally click on the dot and then look over at my image right here as I move it around. And I'm looking at the photo until it looks good to me. 
the closer you move the dot towards the center, the less extreme it is. The further out that dot goes, the more intense that color cast is. And this is again entirely dependent on the mood you want for your own photo. For me, I actually kind of like it right there. To see your before and after, click on this little eyeball right here to the lower right of your circle. So there's our before and after. To my eye, on this monitor, before it was a bit too purplish red. Now it's a bit more color neutral, kind of more of a light blue. On your monitor that you're watching this video on, it might look way worse, but in my case, it looks fine. Then I can go over to the next button here, which is our midtones, and do the same thing. I'll move my slider around, seeing how it impacts the photo, and then choosing a spot that I like. Maybe I could have it more warm or more cool. This is just targeting the ghost in particular. Now, if it is a ghost, you probably want it white, frankly, so bear that in mind, but you can do whatever you want. Yeah, that one's probably a little bit too much, so if I click, I want you to look right over here on the right. If I click on my dot, I can actually just move it one way or the other. I can just barely toggle it on there. And see this number here, S12? If I go to S0, it turns it off, so maybe I just want to do like S4 for my strength. And then finally we have highlights. It's probably just gonna target right in there, if anything. Yeah. This one I'm not gonna to touch. So I can right click on my wheel and reset the highlights if I want to. Let's zoom out now. And if we look at our color grading tab, there's an eyeball. We can see everything we've done at once. And I think that does look a lot better. And then if you're happy, we'll hit okay. Let's save our TIFF real fast and there's our before and after. Let's do this one more time. Control Shift Alt E or Command Shift Option E. And then we'll go to Filter, Camera Raw Filter. This time we're focused on the texture and clarity, which if you're using the newer version, it'll say Effects is one of your options. So you'd click on Effects and look for Texture, Clarity. There's also Dehaze, but I wouldn't mess with that one too much. Depending on how much data you captured, you can either push this further or maybe not nearly as far. Unfortunately, my image is still very grainy, so I can't push the texture and clarity very much at all. Now, before we go any further and hit OK, let's zoom into the photo. And I'm not seeing any color noise. It's more just junk left over from Star Exterminator. But if I zoom in here and I turn the clarity left and right, you can see that I probably don't want to go too far. I'll also introduce some artifacts. Same with texture. You don't want to go too far here. But what I was going to say is that when you zoom in here, you may see a lot of red, green, and blue speckles throughout the photo. If so, go to your detail tab and increase the color noise reduction slider to about 10 to 15, and that will fix the colors in your photo. I'm not really seeing it in this image, but like right there and there, if I increase color noise reduction, that helps to hide those, which could be beneficial in this case. And then we'll hit OK. Let's rename this new layer to Detail. And so far we've done our Detail, Color, and Contrast, which is perfect. We could do a High Pass filter, but I don't think it really needs it, so that should work for right now. Finally, let's grab a Selective Color Adjustment layer. With a Selective Color, we can target whatever you want to, but I was going to say the Neutrals in particular. With the neutrals, we can move our top three sliders for cyan, magenta, and yellow and see how that affects the background. But notice how nothing is happening. This very well might happen to you. The problem is my selective color layer got added below my other two layers, so we're not actually able to see it. To fix that, I just need to drag this layer up on top of everything, like so. Now selective color is on top. And now we can see this is actually affecting the image. So that was a good little lesson to learn there. But this is just another easy way to affect the color cast of your image using the neutrals on a selective color. And I kind of like that right there. At this point, I'd recommend you take a break from the image, come back in 10 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever, because you need to take a fresh look at the photo. You might realize there's a heavy color cast that you're just not seeing right now. Assuming you've given the image a few minutes to rest and you're back at the computer, let's continue on. 
We need to save this as a flattened TIFF and then bring it back into Pick and Sight to finish out the workflow. For this, I'll hit Control Alt S. That's probably Command Option S on a Mac, but I'm not 100% sure. Alternatively, just go to File, Save a Copy. That'll do the exact same thing. The reason we're saving a copy is because there's this handy little feature here to turn off the layers. In other words, it'll flatten the image. And we'll rename it to, in my case, YouTube Flat. There we go. We have now saved a flattened TIFF version, which we can take right back into PixInsight. So we'll go to File, Open. Go to our TIFF directory and grab YouTube flat right here. See how much better that looks now compared to our original LRGB? It's a night and day difference. Then we can minimize LRGB. And now we're ready to blend in our stars. You have two different options. You've got your L stars, which I wouldn't recommend because those are monochrome, or our RGB stars, which are lost somewhere. Ah, there they are. They are hidden right there. So it's a good thing we are staying on top of our naming convention, otherwise we'd be lost with all these different images. We have a problem though. We've got our RGB stars, but it's still in the linear state. We forgot to stretch that one as well. So what we need to do is grab our screen transfer function and our histogram transformation. Then we'll turn on the check mark for both tools, click on our stars image, and then drag and drop our triangle, Click on the square, reset, reset. You've seen that enough today, so hopefully that was pretty easy to do. All we've done is we've stretched the RGB stars. We can now combine that with our nebula photo here. Before we do that though, we noted how grainy our photo was. So why don't we try noise exterminator again? Couldn't hurt. We'll grab that from the left. We'll make this window a bit bigger and I might even increase the noise amount a little bit more and the detail, and we'll try that. And this is what I was afraid of earlier. Look right here along the edge of the ghost, before and after. Notice how it's getting a bit pixelated and too sharp. That's what you want to be on the lookout for, especially these little dancing ghost people over here. We don't want to lose that detail, but we also don't want to over sharpen it. So continue to adjust your sliders here until you get a reasonable result on your image. And I think realistically that's the best I can do right there. Just goes to show you need a lot of data, as I've said a hundred times today. But now that our nebula photo is looking a little bit cleaner, we can blend our stars. This next part of the workflow is very specific, so follow along with me step by step. We're going to rename our starless photo here by double clicking on the name tag. We're going to call this starless with an uppercase S. And I am stressing the uppercase S here because everything is case sensitive. This image is now known as starless. This image with our stars will rename to stars with an uppercase S. All right, so we've got stars and then starless. Now we're ready to blend them together with pixel math. And you can find this along with everything else using the search window in our process explorer. When you get your pixel math tool, bring it up to the top like I've done, and then you're gonna enter this equation. We just combine with a lowercase c, it's that case sensitive, parentheses, starless with an uppercase s, comma, stars with an uppercase s, comma, op underscore screen, open close parentheses, and then another close parentheses. I'm sure somebody will comment down below and have this pasted in there, so you can just copy and paste it directly into your pixel math window. Again, the main thing to take away from this is that if I put a lowercase s here and I try to run this, it's just gonna give me an error because it doesn't understand what starless is. It's, that's why you have to be so precise with all this kind of stuff. Another thing, before you actually run this, you wanna click on destination and create a new image. That way we still have access to the originals here. Once we click on create new image, we have our naming conventions looking good. We'll click on the square button and there we go. We finally have our more or less finished ghost nebula. That looks pretty darn cool. I got to say, considering all the hurdles we want to get to this point. 
The only issue I have is that the stars are really bright and distracting. This is where you can use a tool from Bill Blanchon. He's got his star reduction script. And the cool thing is because we rename this to starless, it'll just work automatically. Let me show you what I mean. We'll go to process, process icons, load process icons. That might take you a second to find all that. Then you go to your downloads directory and look for Bill's star reduction methods version three, assuming that you've downloaded it, of course. If not, you'll wanna check Bill Blanchin's YouTube channel and find that. I'll also try to link it down below if I can in the video description, so look in there if you're still trying to find it. Anyway, you should now have four buttons here on the left. I have seen occasion where they just don't show up, and that's because they're in a different workspace down here. See how we're in workspace number one? Sometimes they're just like in workspace number four, and I don't know why. So you'd have to click and drag them and put them back into workspace one if that happens to you. Anyway, very simply, just use one of the three methods. Let's start with method number one. Drag and drop this whole thing on your photo. And if you've been following me exactly step by step, that'll work without a problem. Basically what it's doing is it's finding the starless photo, which we renamed to starless, and it's using that to help with the star reduction. So anyway, here's our before and after. Let's make this a bit bigger. Before and after, that's considerably better, right? And from back here, we can see that looks pretty cool. If you think it was a bit too strong though, you can always undo it and then try maybe method number two or method number three. Method number three is the most subtle. And if we do our before and after now, you can see it's a much more subtle adjustment. If that's still not getting you what you want, you can always double click on any one of these methods. And it tells you right here, to reduce the star sizes more, lower the S value. Well, if method number one is too strong, you could increase the S value to 0.3 and then drag and drop your triangle on the photo. Just make sure you haven't done any star reduction yet. So we can now drag and drop the triangle onto the photo. And now we're using method number one, but it's not quite as intense. Okay, I think that looks great. So we've done our star reduction method. We found the one that we actually like. Let's now save our PixInsight project again and we'll overwrite the original. When that's complete, we can now take this new image, file, save it as a TIFF. I'll call this YouTube final. We'll do 16 bits per channel again. And we'll go right back to Photoshop, load up the final version. And now's your chance to look everything over. Maybe you realize that it could still use a bit of sharpening or the color cast is a bit weird, whatever you wanna do, you can go through adjust your various settings with either the camera raw filter or an adjustment layer, whatever is easiest for you. I will say though, that because we've added the stars back in, that will make it more difficult to process. So if the image just doesn't really hold up the way you'd like, you'd actually be better off going back a step to your main TIFF file we were working with right here, making whatever tweaks you want, bring it back into Pick Insight, add the stars back in again, do your star reduction and go from there. Again, the reason I'm saying that is because if you have your stars in here, it just makes it harder to work around. If you add contrast, it's just gonna blow out the stars a lot faster. So that's why we do most of our processing without any stars whatsoever. All right, and that's all I've got for you today. If you've been following along with your own data, maybe you have some weird gradients that you've been dealing with, or it's just not holding up very well, the best advice I can give you is to get out to a darker sky because this data was taken in Kanab, Utah. It's about as dark as you can get and try to get many more nights worth of data whenever possible. Finally, if you enjoyed the video, I do now have the channel memberships turned back on here on YouTube. So you can join. The main reason you want to do that is to get early access to the videos. Or if you subscribe to the highest tier, I do a bi-monthly office hour stream. So you can come in with your questions and I'll answer them live for you. We didn't go through and process some of your data if you're having trouble with that, whatever you want to do. But that's all I've got for you today. Happy Halloween, and I'll see you guys in another video.